Hey, hello everyone, and welcome to the Marshall W. Ulrich Planetarium. Um, I'm walking around, but hi, I'm Jessica. I am the director and will be uh, one of your tour guides to the universe tonight. Um, we've also got Brayden in the back who is helping out, and you also met Slayton. Um, those are both two of our students who work here. Um, but we're very excited to be showing you Beyond Bazaar tonight. Um, now, if you have any questions throughout the show, feel free to ask. Um, I may not always see hands, but Brayden can watch out. Yeah, okay. Um, and for our viewers who are watching on um, Facebook Live, this is being streamed, at least the dome view, um, same thing, you can ask questions there. Um, now, if at any time during the show you need to leave, you're welcome to do so. You'll just exit through the same door you came in. Just, of course, be careful because it does get dark in here. Um, and I think that's all I have to say for now. So I'm going to head to the back and we'll get going. All right, so as I said, our show tonight is called Beyond Bizarre, where we are going to be looking at the strange and bizarre things that we can find in our universe. And uh, we're going to start off kind of close to home, exploring things within our own solar system, and then we will slowly make our way further and further out. So for our first stop, we are going to head over to Saturn and explore this weird hexagon that's on Saturn. To see that, we take a look at its North Pole and we find exactly what the name suggests, a hexagon on Saturn. Um, now this is a storm, very much like a hurricane, but a hexagonal shaped hurricane. And it is big. So uh, there is the Earth for comparison. One side of this hexagon is bigger than the Earth is. And this is strange for many reasons, um, most of which is how do you get kind of out of a natural phenomena of this hexagonal shape. And that kind of had us stumped for a little while, but some recent kind of simulations um, taking place in labs here on Earth have been able to recreate this sort of pattern. Um, and they did this, as it shows up, um, using fluid flowing at different speeds as it interacts with each other. And as those different fluids kind of go past each other and hit and interact, you actually can naturally get this hexagon shape. So this is one possibility for how this has formed, um, but there's still a lot of work to do to better understand this giant storm system and its weird shape that we find on Saturn. Next up, we are heading over to a moon of Jupiter named Io. Now, as the name implies, Io has a lot of volcanoes. Um, in fact, as we are kind of moving around Io here, you'll see that it has this beautiful uh, kind of yellow and orange color to it. Um, that's from sulfur deposited from volcanic eruptions. And you'll also see lots of black spots. Now, each one of these black spots is a volcano. Um, Io has, I normally say over 150, but my new research shows that that number, well, technically is more than 150. Um, we're looking at you know over 400 active volcanoes on Io. Um, and it's so active that even with spacecraft that very quickly fly by the moon, we have been able to get pictures of these volcanic eruptions and of lava flows flowing across the surface. So Io is the most volcanically active object that we have in our solar system, with volcanoes erupting pretty much continuously across the surface. And this 
is strange for many reasons. One, it's just extremely active. That's weird. Um, but if we compare it to something that we know pretty well, our own moon, um, we see that Io and our moon are pretty similar in size. Io is maybe just a little bit smaller. And of course, our moon has no active volcanoes. So just to have volcanoes, there has to be a lot of heat inside of a world, a planet, or a moon in order to drive and generate all of these volcanoes. Small objects like our moon once were hot very early on in the solar system, but cooled off very quickly, because small things tend to cool off faster than big things. So with Io being smaller than our moon, it should have also cooled off by now and should not have this heat to create all of these volcanoes. Well, it turns out uh, the culprit in all of this, and now I get to uh, fly around and see if I can find it real quickly. There he is. The culprit in all this is Jupiter. Jupiter is the biggest planet in our solar system. It has about 300 times the mass of the Earth. And all of that mass pulls and tugs on Io. But then on the other side, you have about 90 other moons orbiting around Jupiter, and they're all tugging on Io as well. So you end up with Io going through this back and forth tug of war, causing it to constantly be stretched and released and stretched and released. And this actually heats up the interior because as things rub together, just like you do on a cool morning to warm up your hands, as those rocks rub together, they heat up. And this is such an intense game of tug of war that we get a tremendous amount of heat and energy and it has to escape somehow. And it does through these hundreds and hundreds of volcanoes across the surface. All right, we are now going to venture on away from our solar system to some other solar systems. So our first stop is the system 55 Cancri and the planet 55 Cancri B. I know they don't have the best names for all of these, although this one does have a cool name. Um, it's also named Jansen. Um, but I always forget that because I've always heard it called 55 Cancri E, so that's what comes up in my mind. Um, now, this planet is located about 41 light years from Earth. So a light year is the distance that light travels in one year. It's about 6 trillion miles. Um, it's located about 41 light years away. Um, the planet itself is what we call a super earth so it is about two times the size of the earth what the heck is there we go come on there he is um it's about two times the size of the earth there's the earth for comparison right over there uh but about eight times the mass of the earth so you got eight earths pushed into something the size of two Earths. And as you can see here, it is very, very close to its star. Uh, it's so close that it actually takes only 18 hours for the planet to make one complete orbit around its star. In other words, a year would be 18 hours, which is kind of crazy. But being that close means the planet gets extremely hot, with temperatures getting up to almost 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which is why you see the representation here covered in lava. This is very likely a lava world. So while it may be a super Earth, it's definitely not Earth-like. But that alone doesn't necessarily make it bizarre being a giant super Earth lava world. Um, let's let's go back to those stats again. Eight times eight Earths squished into something the size of two Earths. 
that puts a tremendous amount of pressure on the interior of the planet. So much pressure that we think the carbon is squeezed into diamonds. And we estimate that about a third of the planet is made of diamonds. Hence the title, The Diamond Planet. Now, this is still slightly debated among astronomers, how much diamonds could be there. Um, but it's really cool and really weird, and I love it. And who wouldn't love a diamond the size of a planet? I mean, just saying. <laughs> All right, we have one other planetary system that I want us to go visit. So we are going to head over to the star system K2 18. And in particular, the planet K2-18b, which for a while thought could be our next Earth. So this planet fits within its star's habitable zone. Um, so as you're seeing here, kind of the, the greenish area is the preferred area. Essentially what this is, the habitable zone, is the distance that you need to be from the star in order for the temperatures on the surface of the planet to be ideal for liquid water and therefore ideal for life. Hence, habitable could be, you know, inhabited. Um, it's also sometimes called the Goldilocks zone because the temperatures would be just right. So finding a planet in the habitable zone is extremely exciting because conditions could be favorable for life to develop, assuming lots of other conditions are met as well. Well, this planet is another super Earth. Um, again, it is about eight times the mass of the Earth, about two times the size. Um, so it did, you know, looking good for a possible Earth analog. And then in 2019, we got some really exciting news. Uh, we found and we detected water vapor in the atmosphere of this planet, which was another check mark and another hit closer to possibly having a new Earth. Super Earth, but a new Earth. Now, this is beyond bizarre, so obviously we're going to talk about strange things. Um, unfortunately, we no longer believe that this is what this planet could look like. We no longer think that it is a super Earth, possible Earth analog, uh, because we have found that it actually has a really thick atmosphere full of hydrogen. And this makes it more like a Neptune than like an Earth. But it gets even weirder because it's not quite big enough to be called like a mini Neptune. So this planet is in this bizarre kind of midway point between being a super Earth and a mini Neptune. And we haven't really found many other planets that fall in that range. This is one of the few that we have and one of the first that we found. So being kind of in the middle, it does still have a rocky surface. It is still a rocky planet but it does have a very thick hydrogen atmosphere like Neptune does. And because of that thick atmosphere, um, that's gonna trap a lot of heat. That's also gonna create a lot of pressure. So any water that could be on the world, and it's likely that it is covered in an ocean of water, that water would actually be at a super critical point where it's superheated to the point that it's right on the verge between uh, being liquid and being gaseous. Um, so not really a place we think life could exist anymore. All right, moving away from planets now, we're going to go take a look at a nebula. So a nebula is a giant gas cloud in space. The one we're going to take a look at is the red rectangle nebula. Uh, this one sits about 2,300 light years away from the Earth. 
Um, nebulas, as I said, are big gas clouds. This one is about 0.14 light years in diameter. Um, to put that in perspective, that would get you out to about the Oort cloud of our solar system. So much bigger than the solar system as most people think of it. Um, but what's particularly strange about this nebula is the shape. You can see it's very angular. And that's just not something we usually see. Uh, this is an example of what we call a planetary nebula. Um, and putting up a couple of other examples, um, we typically find these planetary nebula to be more spherical because that's just how the physics works of dying stars. And yet we have this weirdly symmetric angular gas cloud that quite frankly, we don't know how this formed yet. Um, we are still trying to understand the physics behind getting something like this to form. The next stop in our galaxy is the globular cluster Omega Centauri. So a globular cluster is essentially a group of stars, right? Um, globular clusters in particular tend to be spherical in shape. So the distribution of stars is roughly spherical and they can contain anywhere on average from thousands to hundreds of thousands of stars within them. And they typically look like this with the stars being really close together at the center and then becoming a bit more spread apart as you get to the edge of the cluster. Now, Omega Centauri here is a beast. Now I said globular clusters tend to have, you know, thousands to hundreds of thousands. Yeah, this globular cluster contains 10 million stars. And it is about 10 times bigger than most globular clusters. So as a comparison, here right on top of it is the globular cluster M13, the great globular cluster of Hercules. That's it. That is a normal globular cluster. And that is Omega Centauri. It is a beast of a globular cluster. Now with those 10 million stars, especially there at the center, they get packed really close together. On average, those stars at the center are within about 0.1 light years from each other, which is very close. As a comparison, the closest star to us and our sun is over four light years away. So really here at the heart of globular clusters is the only place where you're going to have stars that are close enough that they could actually collide with each other. Now, um, we were stumped for a while of how a globular cluster this big could form. Um, all other globular clusters we know formed kind of at the beginning of the galaxy. They were some of the first groups of stars to form as the galaxy formed. But this beast kind of was you know, a question, how did something like this form? Well, it turns out it probably did not form as part of our galaxy. We think it's actually the remnants of the core of a smaller galaxy that our galaxy ate. Um, and all of the rest of the stars that were in the galaxy kind of got incorporated into our Milky Way but the core itself was able to hold itself together. And so exists together as what we now see as a giant globular cluster. But yeah, it's probably the remnants of a galaxy that got eaten by ours, which in and of itself isn't that uncommon. Galaxies eat other galaxies all the time. Okay, one more stop in our galaxy. We are gonna head to the very center of our galaxy where Sagittarius A star lives. 
Now, Sagittarius A star is a supermassive black hole that sits at the center of our galaxy. So first, what's a black hole? Great question. Um, black holes are essentially objects that had so much mass squeezed into such a small volume that the gravity they exert is to the extreme. And it's so strong that not even light can escape from its gravitational pull, which is why they're black, because light can't escape from them. They don't emit light, so they look black. Now, for a while, we knew of the existence of stellar mass black holes. These are the results of the death of stars. Typically, massive stars, um, usually a star needs to be at least 20 times the mass of the sun, and it explodes in a supernova, and then the core of the star collapses in on itself and creates a black hole. And that black hole is usually, you know, five to tens of suns worth of mass in size. So that's a stellar mass. This guy here at the center of our galaxy has four million suns worth of material, which is why it's a supermassive black hole. And despite, uh, you know, uh, black holes are cool, so I wanted to talk about them tonight in the show. Um, but in particular, I decided on this one because we don't really know yet how these monstrous supermassive black holes form. Like I said, stellar mass black holes, we understand. We, we get that. But these guys are a completely other question. One of the original thoughts was, you know, maybe a bunch of smaller black holes merged together to create these monstrous supermassive black holes. And that was kind of the pervading idea for a while. And especially as we started finding that most galaxies have a supermassive black hole at their center, the problem came when we started looking at early galaxies. And we found that they also have one a lot sooner than they should if they formed by a bunch of small ones merging together to create a big one. And so that has us scratching our heads of, okay, well, how could these form then? Um, and we don't really know yet. And that is one of the reasons we are still very actively studying those young early galaxies in the hopes of understanding how these supermassive black holes form. All right. We have two objects left. These are going to take us beyond our galaxy. Come on. Come on. There we go. All right, the computer was not wanting to listen to me. Um, so next up, we are going to look at something called Hobbes objects. Now, in order to understand why this is strange, we need a little bit of background. So Hulk's object is a galaxy. And galaxies typically come in one of three types. You have elliptical galaxies, which are roughly spherical. Uh, they tend to have older stars, which is why they're redder. You have spiral galaxies, which are shaped like a disk and tend to have young populations of stars. And then you have the irregulars, which are everything else. Um, and irregular galaxies tend to be the result of these collisions and mergers between other galaxies. So having kind of seen what other galaxies look like, um, this is Hoag's object. It doesn't really fit into any of our categories. Yeah, it has a disc-like feature with this blue ring. Uh, the center looks kind of like an elliptical, but it's also like way too just nice to call it an irregular, because irre irregulars tend to be just very blobby, unusual shapes. This is a very structured galaxy. Um, so it is the first of its kind of what we call a ringed galaxy. And there are 
a handful of other ring galaxies that we have found, but we don't understand at all how a galaxy like this could form. How you get that nice, almost elliptical galaxy at the center, surrounded by this ring of blue stars. That blue indicates very young populations of stars. Um, and so we see this ring of active star formation going on with a lot of blank space in between the two parts. And there's competing ideas of how very specific mergers between galaxies could maybe create this. Um, but bottom line is we don't understand. And yes, we have a handful of them to study, but we haven't really gotten too far on deciphering how exactly they're created, uh, which I love. I think it's very cool. All right, our very last topic that we're gonna look at is also dealing with galaxies. And it's what we have learned thanks to the James Webb Space Telescope. So you may know that James Webb is our newest space telescope that launched uh, Christmas of 2021, 2021? I can't believe I'm forgetting. Um, and yeah, I think it was 2021. Um, let me, sorry, it's not letting me, there we go. Move us around here. Better look at the James Webb Space Telescope here. Um, now this was a huge innovation um, because of how big the telescope is. Um, the mirror itself is about six and a half meters in size. Um, Hubble is about two and a half. Uh, so being this giant, telescope, it wouldn't just fit in a rocket as is. It had to be folded up, which means it then had to be launched and unfolded. So there was a huge risk for this. Um, but it went beautifully. It unfolded and is taking gorgeous images of our universe. In particular, one of the things it's looking for are those very first galaxies. Because of that big mirror and the fact that it's looking at infrared light, one of its main missions is to try and find the very first galaxies that formed in our universe. And all of these tiny little red smudges that you're seeing, especially the very, very, very tiny ones, those are those first galaxies. I swear, Right at the beginning, I was hearing every day that James Webb had broken its record for finding a new earliest galaxy. We're now to the point that it has found galaxies that existed about 300 million years after the Big Bang happened, which is absurd. That is so far back in time, so close to the beginning of these galaxies. Um, and by studying these, it's going to help us to as I said before, learn more about supermassive black holes, but also learn about galaxies themselves and how they formed into the brilliant, big, beautiful galaxies that we see in the universe today. Now, with these early results, we're already getting surprises, though, because these galaxies, these early galaxies we're finding, we're finding a lot more of them than we expected, which tells us that galaxy formation must have started even earlier than we thought and must happen at a much faster rate than we thought. And uh, yeah, that, that, that ends us on our big question of how did this all get started? What's this process like? And James Webb is very hopefully going to help us answer those questions. And along the way, it will probably find more bizarre objects for us to add to the show. Um, <laughs> uh, I guarantee the show is going to change pretty dramatically over the next few years as we continue to find more and more weird and bizarre stuff out there. Um, but for that, that brings us to the end of our show for tonight. Um, are there any 
question. I'm bringing the lights up some. No? Not seeing any? So, okay, so the question is, um, has anyone tried to do like a percentage um, of a likelihood of life being elsewhere? Um, there is something called the Drake equation, which does just that. Um, it's a way of trying to think through um, all of the factors that would go into creating a uh, world with life that develops intelligent life, that then develops life capable of space travel and communication, so like us. Um, the problem with the Drake equation, it's not like an actual real mathematical equation, it's a thought experiment. Um, a lot of those factors we just don't have the answers to because we have one data point, right? We have us. And so depending on how optimistic or pessimistic you're feeling, when you go through this thought experiment of the Drake equation, you could get one, which would be us, or you could get millions of potential other civilizations out there. We just don't know enough yet. Now, my personal opinion is yes. There is life out there. There is other intelligent life out there. Um, in our galaxy alone, we have about 200 billion stars, and we have more than that planets. We have several hundred billion planets in our galaxy. And from what we found so far, we estimate about 20% of those could be Earth-like, could, could support life on them. That's just within our galaxy, you know, a couple of tens of billions of Earth. Um, then when we look at all of the rest of the galaxies, which we're currently estimating about 2 trillion galaxies in our universe, uh, the statistics just, to me, seem overwhelming in favor that there has to be something else. Now, whether we'll ever find it or whether we'll communicate with it if it is intelligent is a completely other question. Space is big, and it takes a lot of time, even for a light signal, to travel. Um, if we were to send a signal out now, it would take 100,000 years before that signal got to the other side of our galaxy. It would take 2.5 million years before that signal got to the next closest galaxy to us, the Andromeda. Space is really big, which makes communicating and traveling difficult. So I think there's life out there. I think most astronomers would agree with that. Whether or not we're ever going to find it or communicate with it, completely different question. I have no idea. <laughs> it does uh, turn into that, yeah. Yeah. But it's just incredibly. And as you can tell from our very long-winded answering, um, something we love talking about. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think I'm doing Europa. I'm, I'm really doing the Europa Clipper. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. All right. Do you have any other questions? No? All right. Well, again, thank you all so much for coming out to see us. Hopefully the weather wasn't too bad getting here and isn't going to be too bad getting back home. Um, but please, you know, drive safely out there. Um, we're here if you have any questions. Um, before you head out in front of the TV, um, there are some star charts. Feel free to take one with you. Um, they kind of show what stars and constellations you can see up over the next month. Um, and yeah. Thanks again for coming, and we hope to see you back at another show.